plan to invite him to talk is that, as many of you know, we'll be, uh, there will be an exhibit on quality at AT&T opening this fall. Uh, it's an historical exhibit on the traditions of quality in AT&T technology and, and management. And as we'll find out today, one important episode in that, in that tradition uh, is the contact between Bell Laboratories and Western Electric Engineers and Japanese managers just after World War II. And that's what Mr. Hoffer will be talking to us about. Um, he's a 1957 graduate, I believe, of Glasgow University in engineering. Um, he had experience at Procter & Gamble for, uh, for some time. Uh, and then in 1965 came to the U.S. where uh, he was at the Harvard Business School for a year and since then has had uh, wide experience in industrial uh, management consulting. And the talk, his title this morning is AT&T Contributions to Post-War Japanese Management and Quality. So. Well, you can hear me. All right, good. I thought uh, these are rather valuable photographs, at least they're personally valuable to me. Uh, the, they are the, um, the two American, the two AT&T characters that uh, I met in 19, the early 1960s. And let me just explain the, start with explaining this little story. Um, I'm an old factory engineer, and I didn't leave Glasgow University in 57, I left in 46. <laughs> so, um, but as the years went by, one of the people I came to know was Peter Drucker. And in the, late, in the late 60s, already there were some stories starting to come through about Japanese management and funny things happening out there. And I had one of my opportunities to meet Peter Drucker and I mentioned to him that I was very curious how this had happened because I had been working in Procter & Gamble from 1948 to 1957. And later I worked for other American companies in Britain. And I was able to see how the well-run American company managed itself. And also I knew very well how British companies managed themselves. And that was pretty terrible in those days. And, but they had no way of learning. Although Americans were setting up a lot of plants in Britain, they did so very secretively. And it was a strange paradox that when you came to the States after the war, Everybody was, all the doors were open. You came from abroad, you wanted to see how a factory was run, come in and see it. I'm sure some of you remember that, all the great productivity tours. But in Britain, abroad, this wasn't happening. The, uh, rather naturally, they, you know, they were a bit scared being abroad with all these foreigners, and, uh, and uh, they, they didn't teach too much. And also the British didn't like to ask, because the British were terribly reticent, and we didn't like to say, how do you run your factories? I mean, nobody would tell us anyway. We wouldn't tell them, so why should they tell us? So th there was no transfer there, and yet obviously in Japan something rather magical had happened, and factory engineers from America must have met Japanese factory engineers. So I had talked to Peter Drucker about this, and fortunately I was living in New York at the time, and he invited me down to meet a very distinguished Japanese management consultant, Takio Kato. Kato was celebrated in Japan for having introduced industrial engineering to Japan in 1926. Um, a very charming man, he, uh, we met and we had a little bit of lunch and it put me at my ease. He discovered that I had done an apprenticeship at Metropolitan Vickers in Manchester and he told me he'd done an apprenticeship at Metropolitan Vickers in Manchester and this is this sort of Java, Japanese charm which I'm sure so many of you have met. He said, you know, there are two kinds of engineers in the world. There are those who did apprenticeships at Metropolitan Vickers and those who didn't. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that was nice. But he told me of three American engineers who had worked for MacArthur who he said had been immensely influential on Japanese factory management in the years of, in the, years of the occupation. And these were Protzman, Polkinghorne and Saracen. Two of them, um, Protzman was from Western Electric, Polkinghorne was from Bell Labs, uh, Saracen, I regret to say, was not from AT&T at all. <laughs> but um, the three of them uh, had been sent out in a rather well thought out plan to give the Japanese good advice on how to run their communications industry. And first of all, we have to know, understand why it was MacArthur was worried about the Japanese communications industry because in 1945 and 46, the last thing anybody wanted to do was, was help either German or Japanese industry. But having fought their way through Okinawa and Iwo Jima, people found they weren't sleeping too well in their beds at night in Japan and they felt it was terribly important to communicate with the Japanese people that you know their intentions were benign and they were trying to do what they could to help them restore themselves after the war even though they weren't going to rebuild them as a great industrial power so therefore the uh, occupation authorities 
clearly saw that there was one industry they must help in very clearly, and that was the, uh, the communications industry. They must know what the Americans were doing. And that meant telephones, posts, uh, and also the manufacture of radio sets. And this I find very interesting that uh, an, a Western Electric engineer, a W.S. McGill, who's still very well remembered in Japan, was out within a few weeks of the surrender to advise the Japanese communications industries on how to manufacture better. So I think that's a very significant arrival. And that's W.S. McGill. And if any of you ever find out a little bit about him, I would like you to share it with me. I believe he still exists in the old telephone books. But apart from that, nobody else knows anything about him. And yet it's very likely that a lot of these people kept diaries of what they were doing. And it's very likely he has a diary somewhere with his family, wherever that is, you know. So W.S. McGill, but I've never met him, but I've heard of him. A, a, a very substantial number of AT&T people came up, were sent out to Japan then. A, quite a number of them are listed in my articles, which I don't even know how I brought a copy of them with me. But uh, Jeff and Richard here both have copies of these articles, and I'm sure they'll be glad to share them with you. In the footnotes in particular, I refer to various other people from AT&T who went out to help in rebuilding what you understand as the telegraph, the telegraph wires and things like that. The quality remained very bad in Japan right through until 19... It was improving right through 1949, 1950. And the people that I came to know then, uh, Polkinghorn, I have the exact date here if anybody wants it, he went out about 1948. And he was in charge of research and development. And he was very much involved in setting up Japanese research facilities, cooperative research facilities in what we would now call the electronics industry. Protzman came out a year later, in f about a year later, and he uh, was a, v a manufacturing superintendent f from Western Electric. He had coincidentally been a foreman in the Western Electric Works at the time of the Hawthorne experiments and didn't think very much of them. Um, and uh, this had, was a designed combination that Polkinghorne was able to cover the research side, Sarah, uh, Protzman was able to cover manufacturing, and they brought out a young fellow, Saracen, who had worked for a little, a short period for Raytheon on development and getting stuff into the factory. So we had a nice combination of the three to advise the Japanese on how to design, research, design, and manufacture. Protzman, I think, was the most influential of them. Not necessarily because of his personality, but he just happened to have an immense knowledge of how to manufacture. And when he got there, he said, he discovered, as everyone else had, did, had done, that the Japanese were very good technologists. They were doing a very good job of rebuilding their own communication system, and there wasn't terribly much for them to do, except that they didn't know how to run a factory. And he and Saracen spent a great deal of their time going out round factories, suggesting to try this and try that and so on and get things better. The time came in 1949-50 when it was becoming apparent that the occupation was, was, was winding down. And Protzman concluded that it was the best thing they could do for the electronics industry was to put on a course which could be called How to Run a Factory. And that this would be for top executives only. So he and Saracen found their boss objected very strongly to this. They seemed to have a very strange boss, and uh, they decided the best re reaction to that was to carry on and ignore the boss <laughs> and risk being sent back in disgrace to the States. Because, I mean, their general instructions was to help the Japanese be able to pay for themselves. This was costing America a fortune, you know, keeping Japan alive. And by, the, by, the, by this time, of course, the whole idea of destroying Japanese industry had been forgotten. The whole, the, the, all we were thinking about was how to make the Japanese, the Japanese to pay for themselves. We were tired of this destroying Japan business. It was terribly wearing and expensive. So uh, they decided that the one thing, that w the, the, would, the best thing they could do would be to uh, put on a course on how to manage a factory. They preceded this by making fairly detailed studies of six companies. And you'll see this referred to in one of the footnotes in my article. And the, these six studies, I've since found, were 
are still regarded as being quite fundamental in much of Japanese post-war management. Not only are they a record of what Japanese management was at that time, and uh, Sakimoto, I Sakimoto, the ch chairman recently of Sumitomo Electric, commented to me, no one outside industry knows how far we have had to come in developing management methods. And therefore, these reports are interesting. They will be interesting. I haven't seen them myself, uh, I, although someone at Harvard has now been down to look at them in the National Archives in Suitlands. These uh, surveys confirmed fairly well what Protzman and Saracen had been seeing in the factories. And they covered such matters as cost control. And I've seen this referred to in Japanese literature. Unfortunately, I don't speak Japanese, but I've seen this translated that the, the, the new procedures of cost control introduced in Japan after the war stem from the CCS, Civil Communications Section, six studies. And these were quite fundamental. So from this, they put together a course which ran for six weeks. It was for top executives only. And it ran half a day each day. They were those who volunteered to come to it weren't allowed to take days off. And this, as they ran for six weeks, it ran once in Tokyo and once in Osaka. The Japanese liked this course so much that they kept running it for 25 years <laughs> under the under the title mysterious title of CCS. And I believe many Japanese don't know what CCS means. But that, it meant civil communications section. I have a letter from the JIVTA, which is the training arm of Nikkeiren, which is one of the two Japanese management associations. And they state in it that this course became the equivalent of the Harvard Business School top management course. And younger executives being promoted to the very top rank would be expected to attend this course. I say this continued for 25 years, which would make it 1974 or 1975. <coughs> and when I wrote my article in 1982, you'll see in the article that the current catalog for 1982 of JIVTA, of the Japanese Employers Federation, the current catalog of management courses, all current courses had one exception, and that was the one in the number one position of honor, and that was the CCS course, which hadn't been by that time run for many years, but they still give it the number one position of honor amongst all the courses on management. So this is how the course came to be put on. And here are the pictures I'm going to pass around, two of them which you'll recognize. Have I passed one around already? Oh, no, I haven't. Um, the two of them, large crowds, these are the seminars in Osaka and in Tokyo. And uh, you will get more detail. You can look again at them in the copy of the article if it interests you. You'll find the names. I'm pointing out the different executives. <coughs> this is the, the in reverse, alphabet, reverse alphabetical order from the right, there is Protzman, Polkinghorne, and Saracen in this little group. So there they are with their Japanese interpreter. And here's Charles lecturing at Wasiba University in Tokyo to a group of students. This was not the CCS course. This was another one. They did a lot of lecturing on how to run factories and so on. So the next question is, how influential were the CCS seminars? You'll find statements in my article, statements, for instance, from the president of the Japan Management Association. They were very, very significant. And I've since discovered, since writing the article in the notes that I took when I met him in Tokyo, he also used the word very important for the CCS seminars. And he went on to explain that the reason they were so important was that you will, most of you, will, some of you will know that during the occupation, a very high proportion of the top executives of Japanese industry were fired. They were purged for their association with the, with, with the military government. And this, in my view, was the most important thing the Americans did for Japanese industry. 
and I make rather a snide little remark in my article that perhaps some other countries might benefit from similar, <laughs> similar treatment. But uh, the, the way it was in those days was that the, these were the Zaibatsu companies. And the top management were more associated with Zaibatsu headquarters than they were with the production or sales operations. You could rise so far in production and sales, but this was more like Britain or Europe. There was a kind of an elite class whose real association was with headquarters. And by hanging around headquarters, they would eventually get out to be in charge of the various major divisions. In Japan, the Zaibatsu, of course, were the, uh, you know, a conglomerate of immense companies. But the head people of each of these immense companies really had spent their career in the Zaibatsu, associated with the Zaibatsu headquarters, and then they were sent out. And very fortunately for the Japan, Japanese, the Americans introduced their idea, which was that people who had worked out on in the field could eventually command very big companies. And this is something that the Europeans would never have done to the, America, to, to, to the Japanese. In Germany, I understand a lot of the German top executives were given the heave-ho after the war, but they were allowed back in again. Because to, the, because to the British, you have to have top people to run top organizations, or certainly they were in those days. Um, so this, in my view, the Japanese were very fortunate that in Japan, there were only the Americans to deal with, whereas in Germany, there was the Russians, the British, the French, and the Americans, and there wasn't any sort of close interaction between the Germans, really, and Amer American production people, such as you found in Japan. So this is why the courses, the CCS course, was terribly important. Partly because these people needed training, but even more than that, they had been brought up all their lives to believe that they couldn't be top executives. They just weren't orientated, and a lot of them felt very guilty about moving into the head Zaibatsu positions. And uh, Protzman, Polkinghorne, Saracen all tell me that they felt it was very important for them to be brought together and over a period of six weeks allowed to feel that they were potential top executives. So, a, the chairman of Machusta, the phrase he used to me was the CCS seminars played a very important role in restructuring the Japanese economy after the war. And you realize it's the CCS seminars, it's not the, um, the SCAP, but it's the CCS seminars he said that of. And again, the reason is that this was the only industry that the Americans wanted to help, and they did help it. And then when the Americans, in effect, went home in 1950, when the act of occupation stopped, the courses should have stopped, but the, um, the um, electronic industry kept on running them for a year or two, and then the, the Employers Federation took them over. So that what happened in the electronics industry had an immense effect afterwards right through the whole of Japanese industry. You will feel, I found odd references, for instance, in banking, that their new management had stemmed from what they learned from the elec electronic companies. So uh, there's plenty of references in my article as to why it's important. Perhaps we can leave it at that just now. Going a little bit forward, and this is some material that I've written very little about so far, I came to know a gentleman who impressed me very much in Japan, and that is Bunzaiman Inoue. Bunzaiman Inoue, in his last position, was chairman of the Sumitomo Rubber Company. He died, sadly, this year, in March of this year. And all of those, all of us who came to know him were very saddened by this. He uh, sent me some 50 letters about, mostly about what CCS had done, but also little bits here and there about how his company used the material that they had learned principally from CCS. In his view, the, f the fortunate Japanese executives were those who had attended the CCS seminars and got basically an orientation of modern scientific management. In no way is very emphatic that what the Americans taught under the occupation was scientific management, in other words, really Taylorism. And the Japanese made a very intensive application of Taylor's methods in the early 50s. And Mr. Inoue says to me it, he was a fanatic for this. It included all such things as, for instance, job descriptions, everything tied down to the last detail. So Inoue had been the assistant chairman of the Japanese students attending the courses in Osaka and Tokyo. Uh, 
And uh, when the Americans announced they were going away and the courses were stopping, he had approached the Japan Management Association with Takio Kato, whose name I've already mentioned to you, and they persuaded the Management Association that they would sponsor Inoue and Kato, Kato to tour Japan to give an outline of what the CCS teaching was. And uh, you'll find again in my articles Japanese saying that when they first heard this teaching, it was like the, you know, like the, the veil falling from their face or the mist from their eyes or something like this, that first hearing this teaching. So in no way, I think, was very important in getting something out of the CCS teaching. According to Protzman, Charles Protzman, who was your Westing, Western electric engineer, he said, without no way, the seminars would never have amounted to anything. He said he worked and he worked and he worked. In no way, then, was very active in sharing the teaching of CCS with the rest of Japanese industry. But in the late 50s, there was a beginning of this QC circle movement. It wasn't called that in those days. And strangely enough, in Procter & Gamble, we were also experimenting with worker participation. And it, I, I do know that it was happening also in Texas Instruments. So it's very, it's quite remarkable just how these things could be happening on the opposite side of the world. And I know the people in Procter & Gamble very well in this because I was chosen to introduce this stuff in, Br in Britain, the first introduction in Europe of Procter & Gamble's um, group methods meetings. And when, I, when we started this, we'd never done anything like it before. It was really quite astounding, the, res the response that came. And the people who responded so well were not so much the young graduates like myself, but the people from the shop floor who had been promoted. Uh, we started, again a coincidence, the same as the Noteway did, at the foreman level. And somewhere along here, perhaps the best thing is to come back later to all my charts. But I've got a chart where he dug out for me the, what they called presentations that they did in Japan in uh, 59, 60, sorry, 60, 61, and 62. And uh, obviously, engineers and technologists had been making these presentations to one another, as you're having me do today. And then they brought in, allowed foremen to do this. And suddenly, the number of presentations shot up like this. And if you look at the colors, it's the foreman and the senior foreman who are taking this wonderful opportunity to work out ideas and present them to the, to the rest. So th exactly, it was 57 that we started this in Procter & Gamble. And there we were setting off the foreman, principally the guys from the shop floor. Uh, they were the ones who responded, and we were getting tremendous response from them. And uh, obviously, Inoue was doing virtually the same thing in Japan. And he has written to me that other Japanese companies were doing the same thing about the same th time. Uh, Inoue says, I have asked him, at that time he was, te he was uh, technical director of Sumitomo Electric Osaka Works. And I have written to him and I said, did you invent QC circles in Sumitomo Electric? And his answer is, no, we did not invent them. Other people were working with them at the same time in Japan. But we were the first people to use participative methods on a wide scale and subsequently talk about it, teach the whole of Japan about it. And the way that that happened was that in 59 or 60, I forget which year it was, he apparently approached the president of Sumitomo Electric and said, let's apply for the Deming Prize. And they decided they would apply for the Deming Prize, and they would do it by bringing participative methods in, first of all at the foreman level and gradually getting down. And since those days, the thing didn't have a formal name, but this was participative management. And uh, the word got around Japan that something remarkable was happening in Sumitomo Electric. And perhaps I'll break my rule here and see if I can find a letter from Professor Kondo, some of you will know this name, Y. Kondo at Kyoto University. He's written quite a bit about quality. He was one of the D Deming Prize, he has been a Deming Prize juror. And here he says, Sumitomo Electric Industries was awarded the, deplication, the Deming Application Prize in 1962. In this company, the quality control activities were defined broadly, including the activities of marketing, designing, manufacturing, inspection, sales, administration, subsidiaries, etc. In other words, Mr. Inoue, he used the phrase total, total quality. This is what they were after already at that time. A, uh, and from the top management down to the workers and salesmen, they achieved, now, and this is the impressive words, outstanding and epoch-mating 
They, they achieved outstanding and epoch-making results for which the Deming Prize was awarded. I mean, these are strong words. So uh, according to Deming, according to Kondo, this was very significant in more ways than just the achievement of, of Sumitomo Electric. Up until that time, the Deming Prize had not been two years working for it. It was not an important prize at that time until Sumitomo Electric came in and sort of knocked it flying. And I have here the conclusion of the Deming Durer, and unfortunately it's in Japanese, but I'm told it says Sumitomo Electric honors the Deming Prize. So here we have Inoue coming in now, and again, he's a very modest fellow. He says, you know, I, I didn't think of these ideas. Somebody came to me and suggested that we do it. And I, you know, I sort of said, why not? And it's kind of funny that all the way through from the beginning, I mean, I say to him, well, how about the CCS teaching? Well, you know, that wasn't my teaching, you know. It just, I happened to be there, and I thought it was useful, and other people should know about it. Uh, and again, when I began to hear that things had happened in Japan, I, I wrote to various people. I had introductions from Protzman. Protzman People like Protzman and, uh, and Polkinghorne, till their, till their death, you realize the three of them had died in the last two years, in a way, Protzman and Polkinghorne. Uh, Protzman and Polkinghorne both had correspondence with people like uh, uh, Konuske Machusta and Kobayashi of NEC up to the, up to the, you know, the last year of their lives. Um, so I had introductions from them to other people, but uh, the only one who responded to my letter of asking for help was in Norway. And he always, always seemed to have had this great f willingness to reach out and help others. And I think this is one of the reasons why, I, this is one of the reasons I'm drawing at your attention to Inoue. Because when we look at Japan just now, uh, we naturally take a great deal of pride in what we've taught Japan. But perhaps it's even more important to look and see how the Japanese handle this material and what they did with it. And now we have to, s who are the various great Japanese in this? Uh, in 1965, the JUSE honored five Japanese who they considered had made the greatest contribution to improving Japanese quality. This was in 1965. And uh, Kobayashi was one, Kato was another, a fellow Nishibori, and uh, Watanabe. Some of these I know a little bit about, some of them are not very much, uh, but Inoue was one of the five. And all the others were quite, you know, chairman of companies like Kobayashi um, or people of long standing like Kato. But here was Inoue, who at that time, he would be a director of T Sumitomo Electric, but he was being honored for what he had done for quality. So I feel he's a significant figure and one that we should really look a little bit more at. Now, you realize my agreement with your with Richard and Jeffrey here was that we would kind of sort out as we went along what I'd talk about. So therefore, I haven't done a formal lecture for you, and I was kind of prepared to go in any direction. But this is going to be difficult with such a large crowd, so I, I have to keep thinking, what, what direction should we go in next? I put quite a lot of stuff in that article of mine, because it's not always easy for someone who is not a, a great professor these days to get published. And I felt I'd better just pack in as much as I could and uh, one of the uh, things which became kind of apparent to me, and the thing which in no way drew to my attention, was the role of Japanese middle management in the years since the war. And of course, we are all aware just how terrible middle managers are nowadays, that they have to be got rid of, and the fewer of you have them, you know, if you don't have them, you're obviously much better than if you have. And at the time I was writing this article, I was going around talking to Japanese executives, and they're saying to me, what's happening? Here are these American companies self-destructing before our eyes. Our greatest asset is our middle management. I, so I drew attention to that in the article. It not always said that he felt that the reason the Japanese companies did so well after the war, uh, managed to cope so well with what was done to them, with the firing of the, I mean, these top executives were competent people, with the firing them, how they were able to cope with this, uh, was that their middle management responded so well. And I don't know if it interests you, it's, um, my view of the Japanese is, it's like every other nation, it's always an advantage to come along late to the game. First nation to arrive, it develops ways of going that cope with that particular time in history. 
like the British, we sort of developed an engineering culture that was very good with steam engines and so on. And then we carried on with that. And this, incidentally, was the thing that brought me to America originally, because having served an apprenticeship in British factories, then when I went to Procter & Gamble as an assistant design engineer, to my great <laughs> intrigue, within six months I was sent out as a foreman on maintenance. And I found that half of Procter & Gamble's foremen had what were called, called in Britain good honours degrees. Uh, whereas the British factories I'd be in, the graduates were barely allowed into the factory. The factory belonged to them out there, and you, you know, you could pay visits, but for heaven's sake, don't stay there. So uh, this was what intrigued me. Uh, 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 coming back again to what I was saying, the British developed this level of engineering organization that was very good, where there was not a great deal of technology out in the factories. And they found it very difficult to change from that. Then when the French came along later, they, they and the Germans brought in their polytechnicians and the great people from the technical institutes, and they did get competent engineers out in the factories. But I must say, having got them out, you sometimes felt in the... I, I worked quite a bit in French factories, but having got the, your great engineers out in the factory, the French sometimes didn't know what to do with them. So this, but obviously the Japanese, they say they first of all did learn from the British, the Scotch in particular, on the shipyards. They learned from the British, then as time went on, they obviously moved over to Europe, and they then learned a great deal from Germany. And I am sure this, the German influence is why people like Inoue, who was a first class engineer from Tokyo University, was out in the factory when the Americans arrived. They had learned this from the, Japan, from the Germans, that you need some pretty competent people out in the factory as well. But again, they would not have learned from the Germans terribly much about what to do with them. And then the Americans came along, and this was the great American strength, that they could tell the Japanese what to do with people like Inoue when they were out in the factory. And this, I think, is what CCS essentially did. So how, what have I covered now? I've talked about the CCS. I've talked about, a bit about what in note what he tells me his company did. I list in the article all the functions he says that his company learned from CCS. It includes production control, cost control, um, development of standards, and so on. I mean, this is quite a, a good substantial list of good practical stuff. And perhaps from that we might move to something else. Has anyone got any questions on CCS? I think perhaps we'll stop for, does that make sense, Richard, to uh, see if anyone wants to ask questions about Japan and CCS before I talk about other things. In, in the early 50s, you said both the U.S. and Japan were, were starting these quality circle concepts and, and you know, there was interest. Yeah. What happened? I mean, why are we now, why, is, why don't we have quality circles now? What happened? Why did they get lost? Why did mm. Japanese Yeah. Gone? I think this is a very good question, and it's perhaps one that I should have got into, and I, said, I, I want to perhaps get back to it a bit later. I feel that when we look at people like in Inouye, we begin to see why these things happened. Again, uh, in Norway has described himself that, he said to me that he became a fanatic about things like QC circles. And you may have seen that Ono at Toyota on Just In Time, he says people describe him as a fanatic. I mean, in, in terms of personality, these people are not fanatics at all, but they became quite fanatical about something they saw was valuable. So this is, a, I'm sure, an important part of the equation why more came out of Japan than came out from here. but. I am. I spent a year at the Harvard Business School before I was asked to leave, and uh, this terrible thing that happened to me. Uh, at the time I was at the Harvard Business School, this was 1965-66, and that was the um, the two years when American productivity did this. What were people doing at the Harvard Business School at that time? The big stuff in those days was sensitivity training, and uh, senior executives who were at Harvard Business School were sitting around for hours telling one another that didn't like one another's hairstyle or the way they smiled when they spoke. And this got very, very heated and unpleasant. And um, George Odeon, who was the dean of the business school out in uh, Salt Lake City, he was one of the first people, I think, to object to this sort of stuff going on. And he managed to dig up cases of people actually committing suicide in the cloakrooms. There was so, so much misery inflicted with this stuff. So that, um, I feel that the business schools have a great deal to answer for, for having di misdirected us. Um, I felt when I was doing this kind of you know, research that I was finding quite important stuff. 
And I haven't men mentioned this to you yet, but it seems quite certain that I was the first person in the late 60s, the first person in the late 60s to point out American industry was heading for a lot of trouble. After Harvard asked me to leave, a very famous person, Fritz Rothlisberger, who was the, you know, the grand man of the, of, um, the, of the um, Hawthorne experiments, he summoned to me one side and he said, Mr. Hopper, you said you've got to believe this place, you don't belong here. And what, what I was doing was upsetting them was that I wanted to do, uh, at that time I was looking into the question of using college graduates as foremen, which I had seen so personally in Britain. And I was trying to find one faculty member who would support me in a PhD in what essentially was how to manage the shop floor. And though I went around 22 of them, I couldn't find a single one who was interested in supervising a PhD on how to manage the shop floor. And, and uh, Wick Skinner, a well-known figure in manufacturing at Harvard, he ran a very small manufacturing department at that time and he's told me since that his department almost died from lack of interest. I mean, it wasn't the case they wanted additional PhDs, it was how to just keep going at all. So, uh, I mean, we all know this, that the business schools didn't look at all at the factories in those days and I'm sure that's another part of the equation. But uh, again, when you get down to this, uh, what's been wrong with American, what went wrong with British industry, what went wrong with American industry? I mean, don't we have to agree that everything went wrong? I mean, it's the environment, it's government, it's wrong ideas within the industry. Kind of everything went wrong and you put them all together and you can see why, CC, why QC circles work in one place like Japan where the Americans had put a great deal right. They worked through the education system, they worked through the health system, they worked through the government system, they worked through industry and they may not have done a perfect job but certainly it was better at the end than it was at the start. So that, in my view, is why, basically why it went better in Japan. But uh, that's not a, perhaps a very helpful comment, and that's why I think it's useful to look at someone like Mr. Inoue and his way of working. Uh, in Japan, uh, we, some things we are willing to learn from Japan, and there's some things we're not terribly willing. And one of the things we've not been terribly willing to learn from them is what they have, this uh, patron idea, the, um, you know, the teacher-pupil idea. I mean, that's okay for the Japanese, but you know, we're sort of big boys, we don't need that. When I got to know Mr. Inoue, I, I began to find that I had become one of his pupils. And this, I spent five weeks in Japan in 1968, touring around. And this was quite a remarkable experience because although I went to Tokyo, and then I traveled by train, I spent a couple of days in Tokyo and then went down to Osaka. And there, Mr. Inoue had gathered quite a few of the top brass of the Sumitomo companies and he was going to give a little talk on what happened after the war. And he talked for about an hour and a half and then very sadly he collapsed with a bad heart attack. And I felt terrible about this because, you know, obviously the strain that I'd put him under, he was born in 1906 and he was in bed. He wasn't able to sit up for the next five weeks, during the whole five weeks I was there, so it was obviously a very serious heart attack. And yet all the time that I was touring round, I kept getting little mes messages that Mr. Inoue wonders this, or Mr. Inoue wonders something else, would you like to see this? Um, I was, uh, you know, it was quite remarkable. But earlier, when I was corresponding with him, I had found that he was asking me questions, you know, I, I said I wanted to go and see, uh, learn about the civil communications section, I wanted to see about foreman training in Japan, and also about the training of the level above the foreman, so he organized that for me, but also he wanted to know what my hobbies were, and all kinds of things like this, and when I'd said I was interested in the history of technology, and that I had lectured on it, he fixed up for me to give a couple of lectures in Osaka on American, the history of American technology, and then later he arranged for me and my wife to visit the equivalent, they have a place in Japan which is a kind of a crossover, a cross between uh, the Smithsonian and, uh, and Williamsburg, where they've taken a lot of the old technical equipment and put it out on Meiji Mura and uh, all the stuff that came there from uh, Japan in Victorian days. So this kind of all-round interest in me, uh, and I had been thinking, gee, this is like having a father again. My own had died, you know, so 20 years earlier, and it was a rather a pleasant experience. I was in uh, the Sumitomo Electric, the Sumitomo Rubber Works in Nagoya, and I asked the works manager there if he knew Mr. Inoue, and he said, no, he didn't know him personally, but he had seen him and met him. Uh, he said, you know, if anything ever happened to him, he said, I'd feel very sad, I'd feel I'd lost my father. And he said it in rather an embarrassed sort of way, as if I wouldn't understand it, but I was feeling exactly the same sort of feelings. And I have to tell you a little story here that happened that uh, my wife and I had not been long married at the time, and she traveled with me in this tour, and uh, in Japan, uh, 
people are very fond of their children, and whenever the first, the first thing they say is, uh, you know, how are you or something like that, and then they say, how many children do you have? At least that's what I found. And we would say, oh, we don't have any children. They would go, oh, how sad, oh, how terrible, you know. Um, so uh, this is obviously his reaction. And at the end of our formal tour of Japan, we had spent a weekend up at Meiji Mura. And then the following day, we were traveling, or that afternoon, we were traveling down in a, in a car to get the express train to Tokyo. And the young guide who was with us, a young fellow from Sumitomo Rubber, said in a rather embarrassed way, Mr. Inoue wonders if you'd like to visit a special shrine. And we sort of, you know, sort of, we are visiting shrines. We've been to seen about 15 shrines so far. Why not see another one? Well, it was a fertility shrine. <laughs> so, you know, this poor little gentleman, and we saw him again at the end, and he was still on his back, unable to get up. And here he is sort of arranging for us to go to a fertility shrine. It's, uh, you, know, you can see why I, I was really saddened when he, when he passed away. But this kind of patron subordinate role, uh, perhaps, uh, I'm sure we, we used to have it. When I started off in Britain, there was an old friend of my father who was top professor in the technical college in Glasgow, and I used to go and talk to him about where I, which job I should take, and he advised me to go to Procter & Gamble. He said, you know, that's the best managed American company in Britain at the moment. So this kind of somebody like that is kind of important, and I'm sure that people like Inoue, he's only one of them, and I'm not holding Inoue up as the key figure in developing modern Japanese management by any means, but I say he's a very interesting figure to look at, because what he has been doing, I'm sure others like Kobayashi and Machusta and so on have also been doing. So you've, I've given you a very long answer and I hope it's been useful. Now, how long do we have? We, so we can, uh, the, the other things that I was prepared to talk to you about were what this American management was of the middle of the century, because that's what really brought me to America. And I feel that this, um, this management would not apply to present-day conditions, but I feel that with the great publicity that came out for the new management in the 1960s, we kind of lost a view of what the older management was, and also people now are spending longer at college and less in kind of apprenticeships out in the works and out in the factories. I remember talking to the um, director of operations for Sunbeam Electric in Britain, and he used to like to hang around the factory in Scotland. And he said to me, you know, if you ever want to get in touch with me to a chat, I was a consultant at the time, he said, the best thing is first thing in the morning. He said, I always like to get out in the factory. He said, it relaxes me. He's, he's the director of operations for the whole operation. He said, I like to get out in the factory. It relaxes me. He said, it's my home. It's where I came from. I spend an hour or two there every morning. So that was fine. And I talked to him later and I said, you know, where did you learn all your sort of tricks of the trade of managing? And I said, oh, well, I guess it was out in Ohio. I learned it from an old factory manager there. Where did he learn it from? Well, he had told me these things that were happening way back at the beginning of the century. And uh, my feeling was that there was a long tradition of American management that pretty certainly went away back to Puritan times. So I can talk a bit about what I thought that management was. And I did a, when I was in New York in the 1960s, I made a kind of a hobby of digging into early American management, because the New York libraries are pretty fine. And the one which interest, I found the thing which I found of the greatest interest was the, the Puritan migration of all things of 1630. And historians say that there'd never been a migration like this before. You know, when they sent people to Virginia, you got a ship put 100 people in it and sent them out and hoped they were all right. When the Puritans came along, they sent out 2,000 people in a matter of a few weeks. And whereas every other, take the, the pilgrims, take the folks who were sent to Virginia, you know, a, a good half of them were dead within a matter of a few weeks of landing. Whereas nothing like that happened with the Puritans. They went across, they had good supplies, they arrived early enough in the year to move, move around and uh, find you know, the best site to settle at. So, you know, I'm prepared to talk a little bit about this, if you like. And uh, the other thing that I, perhaps the most important thing to me of the lot, is what on, what on earth went wrong. And I repeat again that it seems that I, it seems that I was the first person to write that American industry was heading for a lot of trouble. And the, the, the reason I was able to write this is because Harvard threw me out and I had to go and work, which is a tough experience. And uh, I got myself with a little group called the Industrial Education Institute based in Boston, and I went through the states uh, giving seminars on how to select, train, and use college graduates as foremen, which I, by this time I'd not got, got no quite a bit about. 
And uh, this gave me a chance to see American factories all through the country. And really, up to that time, I'd been an industrial engineer working through Europe, France, Belgium, Switzerland, Swiss companies, uh, Swedish companies, and so on. And what I saw in American factories really was getting to be quite horrific, even in the late 60s, compared with what I was seeing was happening in Europe. And uh, I put together, I have my slides, and I started to compare the, the for instance, the investment levels. And at that time, it was a very puzzling thing. Although America had the lowest investment ratio of the industrial world, nobody was talking about it. And the strange thing happened was in 1969, 1970, the Nixon administration launched a, a powerful campaign to get American industry to reduce its investment. And the economists have very conveniently forgotten about this now. People say, why does America, has America invested so much? Well, because the, the economists told them in 1969 and 70 they were investing too much. And I put together this article uh, saying that America wasn't investing nearly enough. And uh, I had quite a job getting it published. But eventually, American Machinists published this thing in 1970. And uh, I think, well, people like Al Chandler tell me this was a very important article. I circulated it quite widely. and. For some strange reason, Washington stopped calling for less investment. But the following year, American Machinist um, made three articles out of this, put it on the front cover, and this time the Wall Street Journal picked it up. And they made a couple of articles about how low American investment was, uh, taking all the statistics from the uh, American Machinist. Well, I mean, it's, uh, this is not a thing that I can personally agree with credit for this, but all I was doing was comparing what I saw in Europe and America. I think the more important question is was why were other people not writing this? And I think the answer has to be that uh, the intellectual life in America has become terribly institutionalized, particularly in two areas that concern us very much. One is business and the other is economics. And uh, when I give my own personal illustrations here. Having got this material, I felt that it would be a good thing for me to write a bit more about this, to study it a bit more, and so on. And I tried to get a kind of academic position, because it's not really possible to write very much while you work for a company. People are confused whether it's your views or the company's views. And that is one of the great values of the academic position, that it may not give you much money, but for a year or two, you can exist and get medical cover. So I, so I tried, uh, you know, I, you can see I tried the Harvard Business School and I was thrown away there. So I thought I'd try places like William Patterson College. I mean, in those days it was a two-year college and I felt, well, they can't be that, that terribly choosy. But uh, I went there, I met the dean, he said, um, but at the moment we're trying to build up the level of the staff, you know, and all we're going is for people with PhDs and there's so many of them around, why should we take a guy like you, you know? Um, so that was the end of that. I thought I'd try Morristown Community College. And I know a, a friend who teaches, I have a friend who teaches there, and he introduced me to one of the deans of the engineering faculty. And I saw him, and he said, well, he said, it just so happens we are looking for someone like yourself at the moment. And it's not a, an onerous position. He said, we want somebody to teach elementary engineering drawing to non-credit students. It's hard to find anything less taxing than that. And they wanted somebody who would do it full time. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to do it. But he said, you've only got a first degree. He said, we must have somebody with a higher degree for this. And, um, you know, uh, I, said, I said, well, what can we do? He said, well, if what I recommend you to do, he said, is get a master's degree in something. And he said, the easiest thing to get it in is, is education. And if you will sort of get studying for that, that will allow us to employ you to teach elementary engineering to non-graduate, to non-credit students. So there is this great wall that the, uh, that the sort of business economic group of intellectuals has built up around themselves. And uh, I say this with some reluctance because my best friends are, are all in this position. But I feel that it's been a very dangerous thing just having such an absolute wall as that. It's, it doesn't exist in Britain. It doesn't exist in France. I don't know which other places it does or does not exist, but certainly the two countries that I know best, it does not exist. And it would certainly have helped me. And I think it would help the American business schools if they just didn't have this absolute wall between themselves and the outside. It's, it's not just the PhD. It's very easy for academics in any field to insulate themselves from reality. And uh, I feel that uh, this is one of my conclusions as to why it is, I mean, just uh, this question, how did it come that I could write this article and uh, other articles like this were not really being written except based on my material until the late 70s. It wasn't until 1978 that Congress came along. You know, I don't know, some of you remember the, the great uh, Joint Co Congressional Committee uh, on Economics, which did make strong recommendation that there be much increased investment in American industry. And they recommended that it should go up to 12% of GNP. 
and industry responded immediately with a huge surge of investment. In fact, it was so much that industry had problems, uh, you know, managing it. But uh, it would have been obviously been a much happier situation if they'd kept on investing more in. This was a, an article which I think is worth comparing with, with that one. And this is an article that Business Week published in 1969. And Washington was getting very upset at this increase in American investment. As you can see, year by year, very American industry was investing more. Well, the reason American industry was investing more was that each, com each industry and each company was seeing its competitors abroad getting newer equipment. And the natural thing to do was respond by investing more. But the economists didn't know this. And all they saw was these continually growing figures. And the terrible thing in 69, 70 was, was inflation. Everybody was terribly worried about inflation. And uh, the people in Washington, not knowing that American industry had old equipment, decided that they could cut inflation by cutting investment. And there was a very powerful campaign mounted. And uh, they threatened to go as far as to create a, um, a recession to stop industry investing. In other words, they're saying to industry, you've used plans for investing. Well, let's, let, let us tell you from Washington, if this carries on, we're going to get to the verge of a depression. And if there is a depression and you find yourself with lots of new equipment, you're going to be a lot of trouble. So industry did cut its investment. And it tumbled. It went from about 11% down to 9.5%, which was substantial. And it stayed down there till the end of the 70s. And the academics have not discussed this. There was no mention of that campaign to not invest, there still hasn't been any mention of it. It's all completely forgotten. And uh, they did not change their view until the late part of the 70s, until people had forgotten about the 69, 70. They couldn't very well turn around and say uh, in 71, 72, look, we were wrong two years ago. Uh, let's change our minds. So they just said nothing, as I say, till then. So I do feel that uh, I have my own personal experience as a bit of a useful way of focusing on this business about information. Uh, would you agree with me that a lot of American problems, and this of course is not just American problems, we're getting more and more into an information society. And we still really don't know how to ha handle this information, how to manage it. And certainly when I go to Britain, I find the British newspapers are discussing things that have happened that people should have known about. And I think here we are seeing the same thing. It's uh, even the, the even the, the disaster in the Persian Gulf recently. Uh, shouldn't the captain have known that there was a, a regular flight flying over there at that time in the morning? Wasn't it? Perhaps we can't blame him for not. But shouldn't somebody have seen that sort of information got to him? Uh, this business of getting information to the right people. Uh, this is something which I thought Americans were very good at uh, way back in the 1950s, and I went so far as to write my first article on this. And I was out in Ireland at the time, and I wrote this little article on which I called Racial Relationships and Organizations. And such was the anti-American feeling in British factories that I daren't mention the word Americans. I just said that some companies were very good at handling information. And I talked about a thing which some people tell me is an interesting little idea, was a thing that was very noticeable when you're, I was an industrial engineer in, in Britain and Europe. And a very noticeable feature of the British industrial scene was what they called the resident consultant. And this was the aim of everyone like myself, to, so you wouldn't have to keep packing your bags. You would eventually get to a company where you could sort of so lodge yourself that you could stay there for the next four or five years. And you became what was called a resident consultant. And the key to being a resident consultant was to find a company that didn't know what was going on, you see. And you, as a consultant, could talk to the people on the shop floor, and you could talk to the managing director. And they found this very nice having somebody around who could tell them what was happening in their, in their place, you see. And also, uh, it, had a, it had a very salutary effect. Because once you did arrive, people would tell you that people were starting to put things right. And it wasn't so much what you told the boss, because I mean, one person can't tell him about the whole company, but people were scared that you might tell the boss about something, and therefore they would do it themselves. And this was a very noticeable feature. And that is why quite a lot of companies like to have a resident consultant wandering around, because they, they put the middle management sort of in the position they were scared that the boss might find anyway, so they, they would tell him first. Well, I put this together as a, a, a little analysis, because I felt there was I felt there was uh, something, uh, this is something that, that, that the Americans had worked out over the years. And it was very noticeable that no American company in Britain ever employed a resident consultant. And it wasn't because they didn't want them, it was because they didn't need them. I mean, I had my friend, the, 
the director of operations of something electric, and as I say, every morning he liked to get out in the factory when he, had, when he had the opportunity. And obviously this would have a very salutary effect on the middle management in the factory. And I uh, sort of looked at it and I came to the conclusion that one of the great important things in American management of the middle of the century was how they managed the hierarchy. And there were certain ways that made this American hierarchy work very well. One of them was, I think I put down three, four, or five features. Uh, one was that they liked to get promotable people in every important part of the business. In Europe, you had your elites, and also you had certain elite paths for getting to the top. But in the American company of the middle of the century, you could start in almost any part of the business. Uh, it was, you know, moderate, of moderate importance at least, because they liked to put a sprinkling of people all over the business uh, who were bright and who would work their way up to the top. So this was one way that brought information up to the top, which well, just as people came, got promoted, it might take 20 years, but eventually they would get there knowing what was happening down below. Why uh, does things might change down below? 20 years is a long period. Pardon? In a technology age, information oh, yes. age, 20 years is a long period. Oh, yes. So by the time the president gets the information, down below, might, the story might be entirely different. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And, um, However, that, that, was just one of the, that was just one of the things. I mean, in Britain, where the people had never worked below, it was even worse, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, uh, or it's, uh, that was one of the things. The next one was that they rotated people horizontally in the business, which you never saw in Britain. In Britain, people would go into a department like production control and literally spend the rest of their lives there, sort of little production control engineers sort of churning out forms that nobody understood and so on, and industrial engineers with mysterious routines and so on. But in the, in the American companies like Procter & Gamble, quite a lot of the industrial engineers would have spent, you know, they're not greatly successful people, they would have spent a whole career there, but there'd be other people who'd be in for one year, two years or something like that, getting experience, doing good work and moving on round. So this was another kind of unique American feature, this uh, rotating people around. And I uh, sort of did a little analysis myself. I said to myself, you know, it's kind of interesting, this hierarchy. It, would be, it might help if we could put together a little bit of something intellectual on this. And I had a little intellectual thought. And my intellectual thought was this thing to come far enough, that in your hierarchy, you basically, I felt, wanted information to rise up that I called the domain channel, which was essentially the line management. Line management has to tell the boss what's going on. The boss has to rely on his, you know, his line subordinates to find out most of the things that are happening. But I felt that in the, 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 Ameri the good American senior, now here I'm not talking the very top manager, I'm talking the works manager level, that he cultivated what I call channels of potential information. And that meant that these were, <laughs> like the boss walking around the factory, he might see something. And this is a channel of potential. When he walks around the factory, he doesn't see everything. But he sees enough to keep the people there stirred up and a little bit on edge and keeping them informed. And he says, well, you know, this, this is a chemical plant I was working in. Uh, why wasn't I told this, uh, this caustic pump had broken down? Because if we'd done that, we wouldn't have sent out that load of something to, to, to London factory. We would have held on to it. You know, why wasn't I kept informed in that? So it, the key to it was not that he learned everything by looking at his potential channels, but that he kept them alive and he kept enough of them to keep the people in the middle keeping him informed. Uh, another reason for not using the potential channels too much is that if you rely on them too much, you get to yourself to the situation like Henry Ford with his secret police, where he was relying on the secret police to tell him what was going on in the factory, and of course then the whole hierarchy breaks down. So I felt that uh, the channels of potential information that there were two ways to improve the flow of information up to the boss. One was the, the boss creating these channels of potential information, you know, which, which just means being sensible, normal guy going around and keeping an interest in things. And the other way was to improve the conductivity of this line. And I made a list of what I thought were the factors that would improve this kind of information flow to the, to the senior middle management level. Um, one, I said, was the capacity of the channels to carry this information. And I mean, this is kind of all self-evident. It's you know, kind of a waste of time writing this stuff. Um, the, the conductivity of this line would depend on the ability of the people to pass the information up. If the middle managers don't know what's going on, obviously they can't tell the boss about it. So there's training. I, I listed a number of factors. Let's see what I've got here. And uh, practice of one man, one boss. I felt it was, that this was a good thing. I could change my mind, but that's where I felt one man, one boss. If you're working for two people, it can be very difficult to keep them both informed. I had an experience working in an Irish factory, and there we had two bosses. 
I had two bosses, and I found that if you told one of them something and didn't tell the other one, you could get into a lot of trouble. So the works manager advised me, he said, best rule in this place, he says, don't tell anyone anything. <laughs> uh, and it really was. As soon as I learned that, it saved me a lot of trouble. <laughs> a possible investigation by the boss. You know, the boss is alive looking at things. This is my man walking around. The fact that possible investigation by the boss, that is stimulating uh, these potential channels uh, at work. I felt that having functional departments, providing the functional departments don't dominate the line, they're a good thing because information does go up through the functional departments. In Britain, the, the functional departments tended to dominate the line, which of course then broke down the hierarchy altogether. Uh, I felt that employees of ample and independent status are more inclined to tell the boss what's wrong than, you know, if you're scared of being fired tomorrow. Um, management development, I felt that was good. Uh, also, I felt most of these practices were good. Counseling, promotion, of course, is good for bringing people up. I felt job rotation. If you know that somebody is going to take over your job, uh, the general idea is to clear as many skeletons out before, you, before somebody takes over from you. This, again, involves informing the boss, either putting it right, which is perfect, or informing the boss, which is almost as good. Um, participative management practices, I wrote. And things like report writing routines. Procter & Gamble was rather famous for its half-page report. You've probably heard about those things. But, um, I didn't see it in British factories, but when you wrote a report in Procter & Gamble, you also wrote a half-page summary. And that would help the line management conduct this information up to whatever sort of level it should go to. A presence of a consultant or outside specialist, this did stimulate things. Um, so that was a little article I wrote, which I felt was describing some of the good features I saw in the American effective hierarchy of that time. Does Japanese industry have resident consultants? I doubt it very much. Um, the impression, uh, you know, I'm not, I have a very, I've not had that much contact with Japanese companies. But from what I did see of it, I mean, first of all, the Japanese do not employ consultants to the same extent. I mean, they will listen to any and every consultant, but they don't. And somebody comes along with a very specific skill, they will bring them in. But they don't employ this consultants and so on in the way that, that we do. They don't have all the business school professors sort of coming around telling them what should be done. So the Japanese don't do that. But uh, where this does tie in, And they, we realized that the Japanese still, the kind of thing I got when I joined Procter & Gamble was I had quite a few months of going around various departments doing odd jobs and things like that as an engineer to get to know the people and uh, to get a bit of experience all through the factory and through head office. And whatever position I finished up then, I, I actually knew the people that I saw listed in the book. So in the Japanese factory, you know, the young engineer does move quite a bit. In his first two years, he's uh, working for one of the cat shows in one department, and then they go to another department, or perhaps a third department. They move a lot in their early years. Once they get to the catch show level, they don't move very much. Uh, they are sort of stuck there, and uh, they've got to produce, because, you know, the 55 uh, retirement age comes along, and if you haven't produced by the time you're 55, you're out uh, running a noodle shop or something like that. So th there is a, uh, a very close parallel to this American hierarchy of people moving around, Many of the factors I listed in this article, you'll find, would are apply just as much in the Japanese company, and that's why I would say they don't need the outside consultant to encourage people to tell what's going on, because they, many of the other factors they have there already. Um, so I've talked a little bit about what the Japanese uh, American government was at the middle of the century. The, um, I, obviously, I don't want to spend a lot of your time, but uh, it may amuse you and. Uh, I'm kind of trusting you here that if someday I'm asked to write a book about this, that I, I won't find that half of you have already written my book for me. And um, this, um, this Puritan story may, may amuse you. It was really quite a remarkable story, this. Up to the time of the Puritans, every migration to America, and I assume elsewhere, had been really a disaster. Uh, we'd like to talk a lot about the pilgrims. But you have to remember how the pilgrims organized their affairs. They set out fairly late one year, and they uh, ambled down to the Thames, and they sailed from the Thames, and then, which meant that they had to sail eastwards towards the continent, and then wait till the wind changed, and then set westwards along the south of the English coast. And they stopped at, um, I think, Plymouth and Southampton on the way, and they picked up other people. And by the time they got to their last departure, uh, 
obviously the ships were pretty filthy. They used more, up a great deal of the supplies. Um, one of the two ships had already sunk once. And uh, it was either twice or thrice. But by, by the time they got going, one of the ships had sunk twice or thrice. And they'd had to come back to Southampton again. And eventually, only one ship sent out, set out. And it set out. But this time, it was so late in the year that they arrived in Plymouth, what is now Plymouth, on Christmas Day. And we all know what New England w winters are like. And uh, you know, half of them were frozen to death within a, within, within a matter of weeks. So uh, th this is the kind of background of the migrations. What happened when the Puritans came along? How on earth did it happen that they sent 2,000 people over, and they really all survived, and they set up colonies along the coast? Uh, what on earth happened? Well, once you began to get into it, you began to find, and this is the stuff that um, I'd appreciate if you'd just leave it to me to, to write this sometime, if I eventually get the chance of writing a book. Um, when you begin to do this thing, th there's a lot of remarkable features in the Puritan planning. Uh, most of the historians rather gloss over it as if it was the easiest thing in the world to organize a, an immigration. But Samuel Elliot, Elliot Morrison notices that there was something very unusual happened there. And he's, his words to, are something to the effect that and uh, this he was writing some years ago. In these days, he said, when it takes so long to organize um, um, a centenary or um, a celebration or something, how did it come that the Puritans, with no roads, no telephones, no postal system, were able to summon people from all over England? The decision to sail was made late in the fall, sometime about September. People came from all over England, and the following spring, they start, most of the uh, Puritans lived either on the east coast or the north of England. They came from the north and from the east. And by the following spring, something like five ships sailed from the west of England with all these people who had sold their houses, packed their stuff, and in this England, which had very, very few roads, had managed to get through to the west coast of England. How did they manage to organize a thing like that? And you know, when you come to look at it, it really is quite a remarkable thing that they did. And when I came to look into this thing, I found that the minutes of the Massachusetts Bay Company are still in New York. And what they had done was they had just planned in a lot of detail for this thing. And they had planned what we would call quality, that they had to succeed. This, for instance, the great failure in migrating came from landing on the other side late in the year. If you land late in the year, you don't have time to prepare anything. You have very little chance to choose a good site, build houses and so on, and then the winter falls on you and you had it. They wanted to get across there early in the year. So therefore, they did the unusual thing of traveling through England through the winter. And that really was the key to their success. Obviously, it was much easier to head down to the nearest bit of coast and climb in a ship. But by uh, traveling overland through the through the winter, which can't have been unpleasant, which can't have been pleasant, they were able to have clean ships waiting for them, full of fresh supplies. And if you read the captain of Winthrop's ship, he says that, you know, this day the wind has changed and now it's ready, and everybody climbed on board and off they went, you see. So it meant a number of unpleasant decisions uh, traveling through the England through the winter, which can't have been that must have been easier, much easier to wait till the summer came and then amble down to the Thames, traveling through the winter. Um, he then, they then crossed the North Atlantic in the early spring, which again can't have been too pleasant. But the result was that they got to Marblehead something about June. And they were able to look at Marblehead and decide that they didn't like it as a site, move down to a place near Boston, have a look at that, decide they didn't like it, then move across to the island and decide they liked Boston to build a, they built a little their settlement there. By the time the winter came, they had settlements along the coast and they actually had a ferry service running between them. So this kind of quality, the good out, the good result, was sort of built in right from the very start. And there's quite a lot of other factors that I found that, you know, anyone would have to agree was, was good management. Uh, one very important contrast that the historians do make is that the Winthrop migration was managed by people who were going to emigrate as well. John Winthrop was in charge of planning, but he also knew that he was going to sail with them. And the fact that if you're going to sail with a group of people and all your predecessors, you're a 50% 50 chance, 50 chance at least of dying within a few weeks, I'm sure it must concentrate your mind immensely on, on what you're doing. Uh, by making the people who are planning also be responsible for application, that <laughs> happened then. <laughs> So um, th 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 I found a lot on that. And, uh, and uh, I don't think I was d drawing too wrong up, um, conclusions from it. But I felt that a lot that I had seen of these good American managers that I met in the middle of the century was really in a long American tradition that at least went back to Puritan days.
So, um, you know, so I tried to follow that through various other aspects and look at where the Puritans came from. And this is a book that some of you might like to look at. But uh, I think a lot of the American historic sites, like Jefferson's Monticello, you know, the great practical nature of that place, the, the layout of it, the, um, the fish ponds in the front, I mean, they're beautiful, but also they, um, they served a very practical purpose. The